Okay. So happy, happy that so many could join us the early morning after yesterday's parties, a uh, uh, kind of middle conference parties. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, just a recap of what I did on Monday. So uh, I'm just uh, going quickly on the content. So, so I was covering uh, 45 minutes about uh, challenges and overview of uh, different approaches for pangenomic alignment. I was focusing on acyclic pangenome representations, sets of sequences, multiple sequence alignments, elastic that generate strings, founder sequences and graphs and tags. I was uh, presenting uh, uh, this uh, chaining idea, but I didn't give an algorithm. I will give one today. Uh, then I gave some motivation for enhancing variation calling using these kind of techniques. And then there was a really technical stuff that I went through very fast in 45 minutes uh, about presenting everything you need to know about power field transform and related indexes like a, a backward search and uh, sampling and all these kind of techniques. And then the most important is the backtracking algorithm that is implemented in PWA and all time uh, and some other read aligners. Uh, but this was a uh, luckily then Yoni gave about the same content on the next day, so you could uh, probably follow it then better. And I've seen it twice uh, this week. Uh, and yeah, so this lecture was like a squeezing a, a three hours tutorial that I gave in ISNB 2009 already, uh, first time in the 45 minutes. Uh, so. Uh, was a bit bit tense, but anyway, we'll continue somehow on top of that today. Uh, when I'm talking about hybrid index and R index for repetitive collections. Uh, so this is the part three of this uh, four part talk series. And then the last 45 minutes will be on a chaining of matches on DAX with small width. Okay, so let's go to that place where we were. Uh, so suffix trees, suffix arrays, parosphere transform covered. Uh, this, uh, just a fast re recap of your memory that you see these slides. Uh. <coughs> okay. Backtracking. On Arosvila transform and then this uh, pruning heuristics uh, to speed up the search used by PWA all <coughs> time bidirectional search using soap uh, used in soap two and then this is where I stopped last Monday it was a two minutes uh, presentation of the forty uh, three hour presentation of uh, <coughs> uh, no one and a half hours uh, presentation on. Uh, on Monday. So I think he only mentions, mentioned this in his talk that uh, you can extend Paros to transform the graphs. So here's an illustration of what we would like to do with this. So uh, when you are calling variants using the standard approach that we align uh, reads to uh, standard reference sequence uh, and call that there's a snip from A to D uh, or using the street file up, then uh, a natural idea to extend this approach to graphs is that uh, you have this uh, really uh, kind of a complex pangenomic graph that we have seen in the visualizations by Ryan Chicky, for example. Uh, and now you have the same reads, but you try to align them directly to this graph. And you can align them on the subpaths of this graph and do exactly the same kind of variant calling. But now you might uh, map better the, the reads because this uh, pangenomic graph has uh, more options to follow. So it has all kind of uh, many common variants in it. So you will be able to align through them easier. Okay, but the caveat is that uh, indexing this kind of uh, variation graph is in general pretty hard. So we would like to search uh, some sort pattern in a long, a big pangenomic graph like a bad 
CD, it appears here. Or we would like to even f f search with one mismatch, it says ACAD, A, uh, C, A, B, for example, matches there. So you can generalize parallel transform for this, uh, uh, this kind of searches. Uh, just to get an idea what is happening there is that a, a trivial approach to index a graph is uh, to list all the paths in the graph from any node to the end of the graph. So this is assuming an acyclic graph that I assume all over my talks. Uh, and you could binary search your pattern here. Well, that works. So, but uh, this is exponential size always, if you index all the paths. So to get it in smaller space, what we noticed with uh, Jouni and uh, Nico <coughs> Valimäki, another PhD student at the time, is that uh, it's, uh, you don't need to list all these paths. It's enough to find uh, something called distinguishing prefixes of the paths. And this means that uh, you only, are only reading the paths until uh, these uh, strings that you see don't appear anywhere else in the graph except starting at this, exactly this node. For example, here CP appears only here because if you start from the other C, uh, you end up with C there. So this is enough to represent all paths that start with CP. There are many here. Uh, well, are they? Uh, they are here. Well, in this case, there are not too many. <laughs> Those, but uh, but uh, if you will take a, something from the beginning, uh, starting with A, uh, then I think A, uh, yeah, A is enough to uh, distinguish all paths starting here because A doesn't appear in this graph in any other part. While there are many suffix paths starting with A here. And uh, we, we observe that if you can find this distinguishing prefixes, then you can uh, generalize Parosville transform. So you have this in sorted order, and you look at the preceding symbols in the graph. For example, end marker is only preceded by D, you put it here. A is uh, only preceded by, okay, you take a cyclic uh, interpretation with end marker. Then path CC is only preceded by A. Uh, CG here is it is preceded by C and A, so you put both of them here. Also C T is preceded by the same thing and so forth. So it's a more or less the same as the parosville transform except that you have a uh, many symbols, as many as you have a uh, incoming uh, edges to this node. And then you can uh, I'm not going into details but you can do backward search uh, exactly on the same way as before just put in some book, uh, bookkeeping uh, information on top of this, uh, like recording how many outgoing edges, so you can uh, adjust the ranges suitably. So you can do exact search in linear time in this kind of representation. Okay, uh, but the caveat is that uh, in the worst case, uh, this uh, number of distinguishing prefixes can be as almost, well, I, I don't know, maybe you only can tell, can they be even exactly as many as these, or of the same order of magnitude? But anyway, they can be exponential in the first case. Okay, anyway, there were a couple of aligners after this. Uh, so we, we had our own implementation uh, of this, but then I think ISA2 is the most like an engineered one using this idea. Uh, but still there's the, there's the problem that uh, well, it's not easy to uh, recognize which graphs are hard to index. So, uh, and there are some uh, nice theory around this uh, developed uh, by Nicola Pretz and other, other people on, on Wheeler graphs. Uh, okay, actually they, they saw that uh, it's, uh, there's another paper by Sarma Tangatsan and I think Daniel Kipni showing that it's NP5 to recognize which graphs are like this, that they are easy to index. But if you have a graph that is easy to index, then there are really good machineries to build these indexes and so forth. Okay. Uh, then uh, this part, this is an appendix, so I will skip this, but if I have time, I will come back to this. Uh, so how to do rank queries and how to uh, do 
rank queries on larger alphabet using Babel and tree. So here are some nice animations of this, but I unfortunately I need to skip this to have time for the actual topic of today. That is a hybrid index and R index for repetitive collections. So now, uh, basically the idea is that now we, not that we know that graph indexing is hard, we would like to see back like, okay, if you are just uh, indexing uh, all the haplotypes you know of human beings uh, as a big collection, it's a. I mean, if you just build the boros with the transform and use this kind of searches, it works. But uh, the memory and time complexity this will be just enormous. We have a uh, 1,000 genomes so in a boros field transform, and then doing all these searches. So you need a uh, huge machines to do that kind of analysis, and you cannot do them on your own laptop, basically. Uh, but there are these new uh, indexes that make it possible so that you can uh, you can take these huge collections of uh, similar genomes, put them in one co concatenation and do all your queries on those on your laptop. And I, I'm going to represent, uh, present this uh, today without bothering on the construction complexity. Uh, and I think uh, Christina Boucher is not yet here, but he still will talk about how to construct these kind of indexes later. Okay, so the first one, uh, this is pretty neat. Uh, hybrid index, this actually has been invented by uh, independently by three groups. Uh, I now don't have the references here, I have them later. Uh, but uh, they all uh, came up with the same idea that uh, you can combine the best parts of Lempel's parsing and Burroughs filler indexing. And the rough idea is that you form something called kernel string containing the primary occurrences of each repeat in this uh, huge collection. You index the kernel string that is not no longer repetitive and it's small, you can uh, use a normal parochial transform indexing on that part. And if you really want to have all the occurrences, there's a, you can build a, another data structure that is also can be shown to be small to find the secondary occurrences. Uh, I will not explain this part here. It's not complicated. You can actually use a, just a normal binary search tree to implement it in a rather efficient way. Uh, but I, I will focus on this kernel string. Uh, first, how many of you know how Lempel chip works? Okay, almost half of the people. But that's no problem for the others because this is uh, it's the easiest thing you can imagine. <laughs> To exist for compression. Uh, so, so, imagine this is your string, and uh, you have already compressed uh, until here somehow, and you are now here. So, think of this as a collection of here is one genome, here is another. So, so it's huge repetitive collection. Uh, so how this compression works is that you are here in the string and you are reading some A, G, A, C, A, G, B, A, and so forth. And you go as far as you are able to find a previous occurrence somewhere before A, C, A, G, B, C. For example, so now you have a mismatch on, on here, and let's say, say that this is the longest occurrence you can find, starting here and continuing this way. So you will just replace this one as a pointer to the previous occurrence here. So it's something like a I and then the length of the occurrence. And that's it. So you now have compressed this part, uh, sorry, not, not this part yet, you have compressed until here, and then you just start again and try to compress this one with a pointer, it's your previous occurrence, and you are just constructing these kind of pairs, and that's it, that's your compression. Okay, uh, if that's not, I mean, in the beginning it, it might happen that you have no previous occurrence at all, so in that case you just, uh, in that case, it's a single symbol that appears the first time. So you just represent it uh, with a 
zero and let's say a here would be in this case if this a wouldn't appear before. But every pair in this coding is either pointer to a previous occurrence or it's encoding a new symbol. Very simple technique. Okay, and uh, a nice thing about this is that if you have a collection of, uh, let's say, one genome and then, uh, let's say, p copies of the same genome, except they have uh, some mutations. So let's say that we have all, all the genomes are of length n, and then we have uh, s mutations in total. So lempel chip parsing of this uh, is smaller or equal to something like n plus 2s parses because if you assume that the first one is not compressible at all you just represent it as a like a like this <laughs> basically uh, uh, and then the rest because they are there's a this many mutations on them you can like uh, think of how they are uh, partitioned on this concatenation and you can always have a piece uh, copied before and after the mutation. So this is a really effective compression. Uh, but the problem with Lempel Civ is that uh, it's very hard to do search in the... I mean, it's, hard, it's a nice compression method, but it's hard to convert it into fast index. Hard to do uh, any kind of search in it. There are actually some algorithms, but they are really, really complex and have a high uh, time complexity of doing searches. And I, I only know exact searches, approximate searches, uh, another question. Uh, but the observation by these people that notes that they can combine lempel and Paros Wheeler was that uh, was a nice observation that when we are doing read alignment, we always know the read maximum length, length. So, okay, so it is not going away, but uh, uh, yeah, I think it's like this. That, that, uh, so if you have reads that we would like to align on this uh, compressed representation, and let's say that the, the maximum length of them is L. Uh, and if you know it beforehand, what you can do is that you can, uh, you can from all these boundaries of these uh, traces, these are called traces, these uh, uh, lempel zip pointers. So on every boundary, let's say that you want to do approximate search with k mismatches or errors. So you uh, look at uh, l plus k symbols before boundary and after L plus K symbols after the phrase boundary and you do this for all phrase boundaries you extract these strings here and you put them in one concatenation putting some markers between the copies and what they notice that uh, you are not losing any alignment so if you map a read on, a, on this whole concatenation you will find, find it on this uh, extracted after uh, doing lentil zip and extracting this, uh, this context around the phrase boundaries. You can find every read. You don't lose anything with, uh, L, uh, with K mismatches or K uh, edit, uh, edits. And I don't tell you why this works. You have to think of it yourself. Put it on your backhead and try to understand why does this work. And if you cannot figure out, read the paper. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's uh, not good to reveal things. It's a good to reinvent yeah. always uh, things yourself, then you are convinced that they work. Okay. Uh, Ah, oh, sorry, I, I went ahead here. So this was the lempel zip part. Uh, so this was just explaining on our formulas how this lempel zip works that I was visualizing here. You can see it all in all parts. And then uh, 
yeah, this kernel string. This was the kernel string that you extract this uh, from every trace boundary. L was casing was back and forth. Put them in a concatenation, and that's your kernel string. And this is the observation that I want you to think of your back of your head. That why does this work? That every read occurs in the original concatenation with that most k indels and substitutions if uh, this uh, read occurs in this kernel string that I was visualizing here with at most the same k indels and substitutions. Uh, yes, and yeah, at least we have used this index uh, in our tools that we have produced successfully and work nicely. Uh, but then, uh, uh, okay, the limitation of this uh, hybrid, this is called hybrid index because it uses Lambert chip and uh, Burroughs scalar code. Uh, so the limitation of this is, uh, okay, you need to know beforehand the read length. And if you don't know it, uh, then you are in trouble. Uh, so you have to fix the maximum read length. Right? Yeah. I mean, in practice, it's not a big limitation, but in a, like a theoretical sense, it's a quite bad thing. You would like to build the index and then support any queries. And this doesn't solve it. So uh, there has been another line of research that uh, led to this R index that was uh, published a couple of years back. Uh, and it's based on this idea that I think Yoni already uh, went through a bit. Uh, an observation that if you have a repetitive collection of strings, then you are expected to see long runs in, a, uh, in the Burroughsville transform of a single symbol. So here the name R comes from this uh, number of runs that is in this case e example 6. Three uh, T's, A's, C's, and the marker A's and T's. Uh, and in general, this uh, number R may not be as small as the number of Lempel uh, chip phrases checked. It's still a good uh, goal to add even index taking uh, uh, space linear in the number of runs. And actually, this, there was a long open uh, problem whether you can bound the number of runs uh, by the number of Lempel chip phrases, and this was uh, answered now with uh, Dominic Kemp and Thomas uh, I cannot pronounce the Polish name, but what you can anybody say if you remember Thomas Kotsu Magi or something like this. Uh, they, they were showing that uh, number of runs is for every string, uh, number of runs is at most uh, number of Lempel chip phrases uh, times uh, log n squared. Uh, it was a bit surprising that this happens uh, like this. Uh, so we had earlier some uh, like expected case bound uh, that was uh, showing that it, it's check, check uh, log n, the expected case bound on some uh, distribution of the text. But this is really a worst case bound, uh, this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it's not as good as uh, finding an index that is uh, linear in jet, but still something. Uh, uh, so what we, to do this, uh, what we need to do is that we need to replace all these data structures that we have for Burroughs Dealer, rank and wavelet tree. Actually, we can uh, replace them just with balanced binary search trees to have a very simple R index. If you want the theoretically best, you replace this one with some fancy data structure that is not implementable at all. So this is probably in practice the best you can do. Uh, <coughs> so how does this work? Uh, so we need to, this one operation that is central to everything working with Burroughsville transform is a rank data structure. So counting how many times a symbol appears in a string before a position i. Uh, Okay, here is one uh, solution. There's probably many others uh, can think of. Uh, so we can store the start of the runs as keys in the in a binary search tree, and as values we add the rank of each run. For example, if uh, our Burroughsville transform is this, we add key value pairs one, one, 
4 2 because these are the positions where the run starts. First position, fourth position, sixth position, and so forth, so forth. And we just that at the value the kind of how what is the rank of this run uh, here. And then what we do also that we store the rank answers preceding each run uh, for the character of the run. Okay, so we have a, a table from 1 to r, r is the number of runs, and uh, we add the kind of the uh, rank query in the beginning of the run. So here in the first it's just a zero for these, so before this run there has been no these, before this run there has been no a's, before this run there has been no c's, before this run there has been no end markers, before this run there has been two, two a's. So we have two here, and before this T we have seen three Ts before here. So these are the restored uh, answers. And with this information, okay, we also need to build the wavelet tree of L prime, where L prime is the sequence of characters of the runs. So L prime is T A C and marker A T. And that's all we need, and we can uh, do backward search and all, all stuff. So, and here is the solution. Uh, so consider this query. What we do is that we search the largest E, I prime, not larger than I here in this binary search tree. And let it be associated with value P. So we have a key and it has some uh, value associated to it. Uh, if it happens that uh, the C here is the same as uh, the <coughs> the Barosfeller, uh, the symbol in the Barosfeller transform inside this run in question, uh, then our rank can be composed of just doing the rank query in, in that run, uh, com computing how many uh, symbols C we have seen before this run, and adding the offset of the position. If this is not the case, then uh, we do, do this pre-rank query on some previous run and add the number of uh, symbols in that run, where this P prime is a uh, kind of the it's a predecessor uh, of that uh, position that uh, is the first one that contains that symbol. And this can be computed using uh, this uh, wavelet tree on this L prime that only uh, stores one symbol at every every run, and that's it. So these four things can be computed. This is a constant time after you know this uh, this uh, I prime value, and this is also constant time after you have done this these computations here. And this one is log sigma uh, computation, and just finding the i prime is a log n operation. So instead of doing a basically constant time on every operation, we can do log n time. And uh, this gives you backward search in m log n time. But your space is now, if you look at the space that we are using, we are just uh, storing one integer per run and that's it and some other values that are for every run we add one in a couple of integers basically so our space is uh, linear in the number of runs okay uh, so this was uh, already what we did i don't know a long long time ago <laughs> i don't remember exactly when uh, so this was what, what was called RLPWD uh, and what made, made this uh, actually be called R index is uh, this latter development that happened maybe 15 years after we proposed this uh, solution for run, uh, this backward search because there, there, was a, uh, there was a bottleneck here that uh, if you use regular sampling in an uh, index based on the number of runs uh, our queries uh, uh, kind of locate needs this number of steps. Uh, n, so the length of the whole collection times uh, divided by the number of runs. And this is 
huge. It's, uh, and that was a really bottleneck and nobody could use this uh, RL PWD uh, for any practical use because we couldn't locate the occurrences. Uh, and only, I mean, it took 15 years to find out that there's a better mechanism that uh, can do locate each occurrence in lock, lock and time. Actually, lock, lock and time, but I'm presenting a simpler solution here. Uh, the idea is to sample the beginning and end of the runs. And uh, during the backward search, one maintains one uh, sampled location in the interval. And in the end of the process, the neighboring occurrences can be revealed using something called tunneling property of Parosville transform. And uh, here I have some visualization. If you have trouble to follow my backward search uh, data structure, I was planning to draw it, but I couldn't buy off the previous drawing. <laughs> so, uh, but this one is now visualized, so let, I, I hope you can follow that one easier. So, uh, so maintaining one of, so, so what I was uh, telling you before that we are able to find range in a Parosville transform that matches the pattern, and the index is taking a linear space in the number of runs. But uh, just to know uh, where does this pattern, let's say A, C, A, D, D, occur, uh, we were not able to go to the text position and tell that it that appeared actually here. We just knew that it, it's this range, but we had no idea to tell where it occurs. Not very useful for read alignment, uh, just to know that it appears, but uh, no idea where. Uh, so, uh, so the idea in this new approach by Nicola Pretz and Ray Praviske, Gonzalo Navarro, and yeah, uh, that's it probably, who published this approach, is that uh, uh, during the backward search, you always try to mem remember one occurrence of the pattern that lies in the current interval. So when we are doing backward, so assuming we know one occurrence position that is a pointer to the text here. So when we, are do back, when we do backward search, we go into a smaller interval and it could either happen that this, this position here is mapped in the inside that interval or in case B it maps outside. Okay, so in case A, uh, we are fine because we can just do elect mapping for this position here and we know that this position here will map just the previous position in the text. So we also now have a sample position inside the interval and can continue. But the troubling uh, case is this case B, when, when this select mapping of this one goes outside the interval that we are using for backward search in the back. Okay, so that's why we need more arrows here in the picture on case B. Uh, so if this happens, uh, this LF mapping goes elsewhere. Uh, uh, this can only happen if there is at least one run ending or starting inside this interval with the symbol that we are doing the backward search on. And I guess many of you already know why this is the case. Well, okay, if this LF mapping went somewhere else, this symbol in the Parosville transform has to be a different one that we are using for backward search so here. The, that means that it has to break around uh, at some point with this symbol. So if we build an index for every, if we put in a binary search tree, we build a separate binary search tree for every symbol in the alphabet that adds the start and ends of the runs with that symbol in the binary search tree. Uh, we can locate uh, this, uh, this start of or end of the run that lies inside this mm -hmm. interval and we can follow that one over here, that sample position and we can get this position there using the LF, LF mapping again. And now our space is uh, still linear in a number of runs because for every end of the run we add one uh, value to, to one of the binary search strings. And this takes look and time, but actually this is a, uh, a simpler query than what, I mean, it can be also solved using any 
predecessor data structure. And there are some that uh, at one end in the ball, so, so it's in the local uh, the size of the universe time. And the universe size is here n, so log log n time. Okay, so that's uh, that was like a e. This is still easy. The the kind of the really uh, mind blowing part is this one to get the neighboring occurrences. Uh, let's see how much time. Yeah, that's uh, well, uh, well on time. So I'm uh, heading to the end of this part. Uh, <coughs> so. Retrieving the neighboring operator. Now, now that we have seen that we can find a range that matches the pattern and we can locate one occurrence, we would like to locate all the occurrences. So we, we are in this case here that we have, a, we have one position uh, index x where we know the position in the text where it lands to. Uh, okay, so what we are doing is that we are going to store for every beginning and end of a run uh, we are going to store not only this yeah actually we, we do uh, yeah we only not only store the suffix array value of that item but we are also adding uh, uh, suffix array value of the neighboring index uh, I mean, the index to the left and index to the right to the same uh, same same index. Okay, so if we are in this situation that we have a sampled value, and if it happens to be uh, in the beginning of a run uh, or end of a run, then we are fine because we can uh, we can go here, look at the sampled value, and take the neighbors of it. So we can uh, take a, kind of uh, proceed from x to the left and to the right, and then go forward on those until we fill the uh, interval that we want to fill. So let's say that this is the Parosville in, interval that we are want to uh, list all the occurrences from. Okay, but if it's not the case, that if you are inside the run here, actually these are the, yeah, these are the run boundaries that I'm visualizing here. So if you are inside the run, we know that uh, there's the same symbol on the previous suffixes to the left mm -hmm. and to the right and if you use iterated elet mapping so as long as you hit a run boundary so when when you use elet mapping for all these values here and they have the same symbol they will not land in a run uh, in a beginning of run so when only when they there's a different symbol different different symbol in the parosphere transform then you are going to hit the run here and since we are storing for every beginning and end of a run uh, these uh, uh, occurrence positions, not only for that item but its neighbors, uh, so that's what we can then do: is that uh, uh, so we follow follow this value that we already know, and we cure it from the in the text order. Uh, the previous sample value that we see before this position. And let it be this one. And this is guaranteed to be a beginning of a run. And what you can also observe that this must there must be an iterated LF mapping, so nested LF mapping leading to this position over here. And then this uh, neighbors, uh, sorry, so these ones here, so these are the values that we would like to find. We only know this one, but these are question marks, the neighbors of it. This can be computed using these simple formulas over here. So you can look at the this value here uh, plus the difference, uh, the, the distance from uh, this position to this position plus one. And the same thing for, for this uh, case. So you can look at this sampled value and at the distance you see between these uh, two things here. And again, this is something that I don't want to explain in detail. I just show you the formula and you have to sit down and think that why 
why does this kind of simple formula give you the right answer? But but the kind of the, the hidden uh, kind of uh, idea behind this one is that since the, these have the same run, uh, th these are inside the same run, uh, then as long as you apply LF mapping and they are still in, inside the same run, the lexicographic order cannot change. They will retain the same lexicographic order. So the distance between the sample positions will stay the same for these three values. This value and its uh, left neighbor and right neighbor. As long as this happens, uh, the lexicographic order of those will stay the same. So the distance between the relative distances will, will stay the same. And that's why you can use the distance here and add it to these values and you will get the right answer after that. Okay, so here the index is that just that you, for every beginning and end of the run, you will uh, uh, store in the text order, so you put a, as key the text position and as value this triplet that uh, stores all these three values. And that's your index, and you only need to do predecessor query. So you go here to the text position, you look at the previous sample position, you retrieve these values here, and you do some arithmetic to get these uh, neighboring values for x, x minus 1 and x plus 1, all in log n time. Okay, so this was the difficult part of this uh, paper. And this was uh, like a good enough result to be published in the journal of the ACM journal. That's why uh, it's not like a, if you don't get it at the first time, uh, it's fine because it's really a cool discovery uh, that this can be done. Okay, I think we are ready for the pause and uh, if you want to have guest questions or relax on the balcony. Visualizing uh, what is needed to infer that this formula is correct. So, what do you do? Uh, so, what is the algorithm? Is that you build an index that's for every uh, start and beginning of the run stores this triplet here. Uh, the suffix array value of, of this, this one, this suffix, and its neighbor in that item. And the query you are doing that you know from the previous result that you have one, you know one value in, inside the interval, you go to it and you query uh, the predecessor of this one, so the first sample position that is smaller than this one, you query it here to find it. And, and by the fact of this uh, iterated LF mapping, you can prove that this, these are the correct formulas to compute the previous suffix array value and the next suffix array value. So you, because these are the things you would like to reveal, and what you do, you go to the text, you make a predecessor query on the, let's say, binary search tree that stores these values as keys and these triplets as values. You locate it, you get S A I minus one, so the previous item of this one and the next item, and you can get this one from this one by adding the distance you have here to that one, and that magically gives you the right answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Iteratively, yes. So let's say that this is the whole interval you want to reveal. You get uh, from x, x minus 1, then you do it again, x minus 2, x minus 3, and so forth. Every single one consumes logarithmic time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think uh, Christina will continue from this. She probably assumes this already done. And then, uh, I didn't tell you how to construct these indexes in the first place. And how, how to even build the run length uh, compressed boros filler transform without actually first building the boros filler transform and then run length encoding too. Because that, if you do it that way, that will kill everything. <laughs> You have to be able to directly build the run length and go to Boros with the transform to make this approach work. Okay, but yeah, let's have a more pretty approach because now you can pocket everything for a while. I'm starting something from a little different. We have heard a couple of times uh, uh, this uh, term chaining of matches during this, these talks. Uh, so I will now present a couple of algorithms for doing chaining. And uh, okay, this doesn't have much to do with the previous presentation. Uh, looks like, I mean, appears somehow ra random. This, uh, choice of topics, but uh, actually the idea is that uh, if you couldn't follow the previous one, now you can uh, zero your mind and start from uh, scratch completely. Uh, okay, so the motivation for chaining is that uh, we would like to do a long read alignment on uh, tangential graphs or actually also on a transcriptome graph, like splicing graphs. Uh, and uh, uh, so our assumption here is that somebody has given us uh, anchors or seeds. Uh, there are some small part of the, so this is the long read and this is our function on graph. And somebody has given us information that, okay, this one here appears here. So goes through this edge here, and then this one appears here, it also appears here. So these are already given. Uh, this is a bit actually bad assumption because I don't know any any good algorithms to find these seeds. Like I could have a good worst case guarantee because this problem is uh, again one of those that cannot be solved in better than a quadratic time. Uh, finding an exact hits in a, in a graph. But if the graph has some structure, there are fast algorithms. But uh, here I just assume that I have a DAC. Uh, uh, nodes are the strings, and then I have edges between the nodes, and I assume this is a A-sided graph uh, here as well. Okay, uh, what is the output? Is that we would like to find a path that matches this long read, and we do it directly by having these seeds, seed hits and finding uh, a subset of those that satisfy this uh, linear order both in the graph and in, the, in this uh, long read. And we want to optimize something, so we optimize the coverage of the long read by these seed hits to make things uh, simple. And this is called collinear chaining because you want to satisfy linear linearity in a both inputs. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so how to, how to solve this uh, problem? Uh, well, first we have to see whether we can solve this on uh, when we are given uh, two strings as input. And there's a long history of lit uh, literature of uh, solving this problem. Uh, okay, and for this problem, the reason why we want to do it like this that we we are first given anchors and then we are doing the chaining is because uh, if you align this, if you remember from my very first uh, uh, part of my Monday lecture, uh, we can do its uh, kind of alignment of a read against the graph, but it takes quadratic time. Uh, 
uh, and we want to do it faster. So if you have a not too many seed hits, for example, minimizer hits or maximal exact matches between a graph and a long read, uh, then if we have a small input of those seeds and we can do very fast chaining, find this uh, nice subset of these seeds, then we have a good approach to solve this problem uh, in, in practice. And once we have found the chain, we can uh, do kind of local uh, realignment of the path. But we know already where it appears, so we can then do the alignment only on that path against this uh, long read, and you can get the alignment as a result. Okay, so that's the reason why we do it indirectly like this. Uh, okay. Uh, so what we know about is that if you have two input, two strings as input, not graph and a string, you can do it in n log n time where n is the number of anchors. And what I'm presenting here is that you can extend it to the string uh, versus DAC case. And the running time is uh, number of etsies times k log uh, number of nodes plus number of anchors times k log n. So there's an extra term k here compared to this one. And this k is now a parameter of the graph. And here is the minimum number of paths you needed to cover the DAG. Uh, and we actually studied this parameter. So we were uh, computing the 1000 genome uh, uh, graph, uh, pan-genome graphs. Uh, for example, for chromosome 2, uh, no, actually, this is uh, for splicing graphs. We, yeah, okay. But we have a later, later done this also on the pan-genome graphs. And in, in both cases, this number of k is very small. On the splicing graphs, it's uh, less than 10. And I think for the pan-genome graphs, it's even less. So, like less than 8, uh, if you build it. And I mean, this is completely natural if you think of. What, how the pensional graphs look like. There's a linear backbone, and then there are some variants here and there. They are usually not overlapping hugely. So you can find a, a one path uh, that uh, matches all the nodes that are in the backbone. You find the second path that hits uh, most of the variants, and then you have to find still a few more paths that uh, hit the other variants. And, uh, there are some hairy places in the genome where you need more than two paths to go through the genome. And that's where you get this, uh, this uh, case could be a bit larger than two or three. And in our experiments, it never exceeded there. So it's a very small para parameter. And we have now good algorithms to compute this optimal chain using, using this parameter. Okay, uh, but let's first see what the chaining is on strings. Uh, and here I'm kind of, I try to simplify things as much as possible. So I'm uh, only finding a chaining where the consecutive anchors kind of have any overlap with each other. So it's, the chain should look like this, that there's a, there is an anchor here. So this part matches this part and the next, uh, seed can be like this, that there's a, this part here and this part here, and th this can, cannot have any overlap with each other. Uh, <coughs> okay, so in uh, mathematical terms, uh, this uh, chain that we find uh, needs to form a total order such that for all of this uh, uh, tuples, A, B, C, D, so here A is the beginning of an anchor in the in this string, B is the end of the anchor in this string, C is the beginning of the anchor in this other string, and D is the end of the anchor in this other string. So you need these four numbers to represent an anchor like this. And okay, if you have gamers, you need only three numbers: the beginning, the beginning here, and then the length gamer length. But in general, these anchors could be of very length. They could be approximate matches, for example. And it has to hold that uh, you, you can make this ordering that uh, an anchor 
tuple is smaller than the other one, uh, if and only if the end here is smaller than the beginning here and the end here is smaller than the beginning here. And then you have a total order for this uh, anchors. Okay, and we want to find that kind of chain that where all the pairs, consecutive pairs in this chain satisfy this total order. Uh, and here is a uh, uh, kind of modification of a classical algorithm to compute this, uh, this kind of training. Uh, so the al algorithm might, might try to visualize it if I can draw this uh, on top of the previous drawing. Uh, so the algorithm is that you duplicate all the tuples and sort them using as the, uh, the A as the key for one copy and B as the key for the other copy. Associate the tuple identified for each copy, break ties by placing type A copies first. Initialize binary search tree with key value where there are zero, 0, go through the sorted tuples. Okay, maybe I can visualize here. So, assume you have sorted these tuples now, they are on this line, and you jump. Uh, over the endpoints of this anchors in, in one string. So you hit here, for example. And if you encounter uh, this anchor the first time, because we have two copies for every anchor, if you hit it when uh, uh, kind of, uh, hitting the beginning of the anchor, uh, you store uh, the value that we have in the table C uh, for coverage, uh, uh, you store there the value B plus D plus, sorry, B plus D minus C plus 1, where B is the value associated with the largest key in the uh, binary search tree smaller than C. Okay, you don't yet, you shouldn't yet know what this value B actually is, but uh, the value is the, the uh, score of the best chaining so far, see, uh, such that you can add it, add this anchor to it, meaning that uh, there's no overlap with the previous part of the chain, uh, and this is a truly larger than the, kind of the previous uh, anchor, the last anchor you see in that uh, chain. Okay, so you compute this score. Uh, using this formula, uh, this D value you can get from this binary search tree, and D minus C are parameter. I mean, theta is just the length of this uh, letter uh, part of the anchor. Uh, uh, okay, so you compute it, but you don't store it yet on the binary search tree. So when encountering uh, the, the same double second time, you en you encounter it when you hit this uh, end of the this uh, anchor, uh, you will add this the value you computed to the binary search tree. So you update the value d of a key d in a binary search tree. So d is now the endpoint here. To the maximum of uh, the pre previous value you have stored there and the score you just computed over here. And when you go over like this, uh, the endpoints of the anchors that we have sorted based on this string, uh, the maximum value in this coverage table reveals the score and also the last double uh, in this optimal chain, and then you can backtrack the solution from, from this. Let's see. Okay, I don't have any visualization of the actual, actual algorithm. Uh, <coughs> But yeah, I, I tried it because this is important to understand the, the, the yeah. time for this. So let's look at it again. <coughs> so what happens here is that uh, let's look at the, how the algorithm goes. Search 
decrease any tick, so there's just value zero there. So the maximum value you get from here is uh, is zero. So you you add uh, to the table at the value. Okay, let's say that is the first anchor. You add value. No, you add value uh, that is the length of this one here. So this is now C and D. You add uh, D minus C plus one. So that means that okay, if a chain uses this uh, anchor, uh, the part that you can cover from this string here is of length D minus C plus one. Okay. Uh, you just compute it, you don't store it anywhere. And then you come up here, so you go, go to this endpoint in this order. Uh, at this point, you only store it in the binary search tree. And you use update operation. So you update the, uh, yes, you update the key with value D, uh, D, D, and you add value C. C1. Yeah. This is what you do. Okay. Then you jump here. Uh, you do the same. Uh, but now you make a query on the uh, binary search tree with this value that is now okay, let's say C prime here. Uh, and you want to find the last uh, not the, uh, key that has the last. Uh, last score so far in the final. So you, yeah, you try to find the maximum value in the binary search tree score so far. And there's a query for that. So you can uh, you can implement something called brain uh, brains max query in the binary search tree uh, from minus infinity to position C prime minus one. And this tells you what is the maximum score you have stored that is uh, uh, using an anchor that ends before this position. Okay, this will return you at this case zero because you have only one item stored there, but the key of this one is this D, and it's larger than C prime, so you don't use it. So you will update, uh, okay, you, you compute C2. Uh, becoming uh, zero, and when you go here, you will add it to the binary search tree uh, with the value of D prime, E prime, and then uh, sorry, E D prime and value of C C two. Like this, and that's how you go on. You jump between this here. You compute to to a range maximum here to kind of guarantee that the previous double that you take into the chain is smaller than this one and doesn't overlap it. And so forth. And the reason why we are doing it in two parts that we are just simply adding the this uh, value already to the binary search here. Yeah. In this case C2 uh, should be the the size of the ah, yeah. Sorry, yes, it should be the same thing as the yeah, plus one. You have the length of that. Yeah. yeah. And the reason why we are doing this in two parts is that if you add it too early, there might be a couple that overlaps this one here. And it wouldn't take it. I mean, if you want to find a chain that doesn't have a lot of overlaps, if you have already added it to the binary search tree, then when you compute this one, it could take this in, into account and it could give a false result. So that's why we are doing it then uh, in a kind of a jumping in the beginning and end. So if you have seen uh, algorithms for computational geometry, it's like the speed line algorithm there. It's doing this one. Uh, computation. Okay. So after you have computed and you look uh, using this range max and update operations, uh, you will finally find, uh, I think in this case you would find that this one, two, three, four, four uh, 
is uh, the largest, so this one, and the optimal chain should look like this one. So you cannot, you might not take this into account if it's in the chain because with these ones you are going to cover better this frame here. And that's the goal in this optimization criteria. Okay, but this is uh, like the very simplest uh, optimization you can do to try to optimize the coverage of this one. And there are many variants of this. And then you need to use many binary search trees. If you want to also allow that the anchors can overlap, but they can overlap only like a nice slip, that they, they, can, like a, they cannot go in process, then uh, you need to use, I think, four different binary search trees to add the values. You have to take two case analysis on all those and think about what, what to do, and it get, gets a bit complex, but it's doable. Okay. Well, I hope you got some intuition on how this chaining now works. And since every operation in the binary search tree takes log n time, the whole thing takes n log n time. Yeah. Sorry, but now at the end you said that, for example, we're taking this as the optimum. Is that because CMD would be uh, a larger distance than C prime and D prime? Or? Yeah, so here we only optimize uh, how well you can cover this uh, string here. Yeah. And this, this anchor will cover this part, this anchor will cover this part and this part. And if you ignore this one and take that, okay, it could be that this is, I mean, my visualization says it's not very accurate. Let's say that this is uh, much longer. Okay, then I was. Yeah, it could be like this. Then it makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so basically, uh, you, you solve the uh, linearity in this string by sorting, and in the other string you solve it by using binary search tree. That's the rough idea what is happening here. Okay, so yeah, I hope you got some idea how this works. And then uh, this is the last technical thing. Uh, the rest I will go in more uh, like a high level because I think I we don't have too much time left. Uh, so, how, how can we use this for string against the graph thing? Well, the idea is that we somehow linearize the graph. And the idea to linearize the graph is that we find a path cover of the graph, meaning that we want to find a minimum number of paths that uh, cover all the nodes of the graph. So here is a red path, blue path, uh, green path. And I think that in this example, you need three paths be able to cover all the nodes. And now you can think of simulating this same algorithm that we have here, but instead of having a, just one thing here, you, you have, a, you have a, like a red, blue, and green here, and you somehow do them in synchronization. Yeah, and you have a, like a, from this financial tree, you have a three copies of it, and you kind of use all of them. Uh, uh, let's say if I can, this, uh, yeah, there, there are quite many parts, so I, maybe I don't want to go into full details here, just giving the intuition that uh, the idea is roughly that you, uh, for every anchor here, you store these uh, coverage values during the algorithm in all the paths. So like in the red, red data structure, in the green data structure, and in the blue data structure. And when you go on, uh, uh, if you want to compute information here, in the beginning of the anchor, you are looking at that which paths are going through this one. And you take the value from, uh, the maximum value from a uh, red data structure, from green and from blue. And the nice thing here is that you know that you can read uh, from this tuple to here if it's in the red, I mean, if the red path goes through both of them, you know that there's a path from here to here, so you can read them. Uh, you can read this tuple from, from this tuple. 
So you can safely take the value from, from that uh, red data structure. You can take it from green and from blue. So fortunately here, all this, uh, all this paths uh, go through this beginning of the tuple. So you do that same operation as here, but you do it in three times, as many times as you have this uh, path covering that one. And in the end of the tuple, you add that uh, value to these paths, uh, to these data structures. And that's how you move on. And you can go in any topological order through this graph, and you are uh, guaranteed to satisfy this uh, linearity uh, order of the computation. Okay, so that, that's the, how the algorithm goes. And okay, this is some. I already said that you make it a furious from all, all the paths. Uh, okay, so what I assume here that you have a, already done a minimum path cover. This is Polonon uh, times all local problem. And actually, there was just a, some, uh, if you have followed the little uh, what is happening in the theoretical computer science literature, there's a breakthrough result that. Uh, you can solve maximum flows in a time number of edges to the power of one plus small one. I don't know if this is published yet, it's in the R side, but there has been some news uh, coverage on this. Yeah? Uh, do you know a search term we can use to look at it? Sorry? Do you know what a name or a search term we can use to look at it on uh, I have been a little bit to this. I will show you in the end. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So previously it was only known to be somehow quadratic, uh, the maximum flow, number of edges times uh, number of nodes. And but there was a claim to be a breakthrough. So we can use it uh, for this path cover because you can uh, you can reduce path cover in the max flow problem. Uh, but during the time we published this, we didn't know, I mean this didn't exist yet. So we, we gave a practical solution that yeah, actually, it, it, this is also nice because it uses uh, this parameter k, number of uh, paths in the cover, uh, as a parameter. And this is, a, this is a really nice algorithm that I... Uh, okay, let, let me first tell how it works and then I simulate it. So, uh, first we build a greedy approximation in time, number of edges times k to look number of nodes. Uh, so you do the following thing, thing that you repeat. Uh, you find by simple dynamic programming in linear time in the size of the graph, the path that covers maximum number of uncovered nodes. And you do this until you have covered everything. And if you use the set cover approximation analysis, you notice that this is actually the same thing you are doing. And that need, means that you are making a uh, at most k times log number of node number of paths, where k is the optimal solution. And once you have found that solution, you can uh, improve it by applying for this classical port Fulkerson algorithm into an optimal uh, path cover. So I'm simulating this algorithm here. So here's the graph, and here are the uncovered nodes. Uh, they are marked with one because they are not yet covered. Uh, and I'm computing a dynamic programming table in topological order uh, that tells me that what is the number of nodes I can cover if I take this node into account. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. What, what is the best path to cover this node that uh, covers most of the uncovered nodes so far? Uh, and I get the information that there's uh, six nodes uh, as the maximum, and then I backtrack and I find one path that covers six nodes, and I mark them uh, zeros, the nodes that I already covered, and I repeat the algorithm again, find that there's a path that can still cover two nodes, I find this one, and then there's still one node uncovered and I need to find another iteration, the green path. Okay, and that's my uh, path cover. This could be an This is a greedy approximation, so it could could be that this is not optimal. Uh, 
So what we can do is we, we can convert it in, in the maximum flow problem where we have capacities on this. Uh, uh, okay, in the nodes, so you can split a node in the nets. Node, heads node. You can have capacity there, and then you solve uh, the flow problem on this using for Fulkerson, but actually in this case there's no augmenting uh, source to sync that, so this flow is optimal. So in this example it uh, counts. But, uh, but you, can, you have to do this uh, augmenting path at most k times, so you will find the optimal answer. Okay, so I'm almost finished. I think we started a bit uh, late. So, so ah, okay, it's uh, still on time, although we, we started late. So, I, I spent the last minutes to uh, show you the literature and some open problems and so forth. Uh, so, this uh, overlapping AND course that I was showing here, uh, they are pretty much solved in the string against string case. Uh, so, there are already Good solutions for that, but when you have a graph and uh, a string, and these anchors can overlap, uh, this is not yet fully understood uh, how, how it can be done uh, fast. Uh, okay, so we, we did some some very like a uh, inefficient things. We found suffix prefix overlap uh, by FM index on lots of that and all kind of things, but. Those are not implemented, and they are pro probably not practical. Uh, <clears throat> in a layer, I mean, we have a recent work that shows that if you have allow only one node overlaps, uh, like this, that you, if you have a graph, uh, and you have a, 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 G, 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 some long string here, like this, and your tuple is uh, something like this, and then there's another double matching here. We can handle it if they fit in one node in this graph. So if two, two anchors match only in the end, so they hit, they, and this, this uh, overlap is not longer than, than the node, uh, node where they are uh, stored, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, then we can handle it. And this seems to work always uh, good enough in practice. So in practice, we have practical solution, but in theory there could be some improvement on this approach. Okay, so here are the references. So maybe I'll say some words because I didn't always mention where the results came from uh, earlier. So, uh, so most of the content is from uh, this book that we wrote uh, six years ago. Uh, the difficulty of finding uh, uh, indexes for graphs uh, with these complexity theory uh, connections is in this paper by Massimo Ekui and others. Massimo just defended the thesis uh, on these kind of results. Uh, then these bounder graphs that I mentioned, but I didn't show any results on that. You can find them here. Uh, uh, this uh, motivational example of how to enhance variation calling is from this paper by Pukanori, who also defended uh, the thesis just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then this is the RL PWD result. Okay, it was from the year, year 2010 and was, I guess, in Ripon uh, a year earlier. Uh, and then it took uh, all 10 years until Travis K. Gonzalo Navarro and Nicola Prezza found uh, this nice sampling scheme that I was visualizing to today. And this is now called R index, this uh, thing. And it has been widely developed uh, further after that. Uh, Dominic Kemp and Thomas uh, okay, I forgot the last name, uh, they found this uh, result that. Uh, that uh, the runs in the Burroughs will runs from R uh, bounded by check jet log n, where z is the number of Lempel chip phrases. This is the uh, this last result that I was showing to chaining algorithm on DAX. And 
here you can find uh, the string against string chaining algorithm that explains how these overlaps are taken into account. And this is a revisited paper because it already exists in lit literature, but we couldn't understand the previous results, so we wrote it again, <laughs> basically. Uh, and then this is the claimed almost linear time maximum flow result. Leach and Rasmus King. I don't know any of these guys. <laughs> uh, but it, it has been many new slides, so I, I think it, some, some people working on flows appreciate that it's correct. And so uh, Okay. And then last. Uh, uh, we are writing a second version of this uh, book and it's now accepted to be published by the same publisher and it should come out in next year, early next year and there I will cover all these things I covered today uh, I mean, the new things that were not in the previous edition and some other things You can still affect the content, so if you have your favorite topics that you would like to see in a textbook you can, you can hint me I might be able to sneak the links though. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Well, thanks, Brady. Thanks, Brady. Very nice. Questions? Oh, I have one question. Yes. Yeah. Since these, uh, these are young PhD students. Yeah. Uh, what is the future? So you know, what, what, what should be interesting problems for them to start working on? Ah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good, good question because I don't know, really know my, myself. <laughs> we have exhausted many directions. Uh, for example, I, I'm now working still with the founder graphs a bit. We have still mm -hmm. some open problems there. Uh, but maybe not too many to kind of share. Uh, <laughs> I have one PhD student who should solve all of them. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, what should I say? Uh, so, okay, so my presentation was on, on very like a, on this classical model of computation that everything is. Uh, uh, you work on RAM and you don't care about the cache heap or so, something like this, but in practice uh, everything, I mean, you can create fancy algorithms, but if they are summing around your memory, they will be really slow. So, uh, so make, making uh, kind of engineering these things that I was uh, presenting here so that they work in practice fast using uh, some proper uh, I.O. model, it's a direction uh, to go. I think Yoni has done a lot of that kind of development already and then okay so maybe maybe one more conceptual thing is that uh, so there are many uh, I mean how I see this uh, this uh, pan genomics uh, uh, development is that there are there's very strong uh, uh, groups doing uh, this uh, variation graphs and kind of graph based uh, pan genomics uh, and then there's uh, some theory development on this, uh, you know, this R index and all this kind of stuff, uh, which are not developed in the practical uh, kind of uh, setting. I mean, there's no uh, there's no API uh, developed to the full like in the pan genomic graphs. There's a really nice interfaces that you can plug plug and play these uh, these things together. So yeah, I think that there's a lot of room in. Uh, taking these uh, algorithmic developments on the uh, collections of sequences and making them really functional as, a, as an alternative representation of pangenomes. Uh, and then let's see for the future which one is winning the game in the end. That, that is the uh, kind of the graph things uh, efficient enough that they can be used. Or will this uh, uh, linear genome based things still kind of, uh, come back and take the scheme. Uh, I mean, one benefit, of course, on, on these things that I was presenting here is that uh, they are much easier to visualize than 
you saw these uh, Pantenon crabs, uh, they are very hairy to visualize. So, and it's hard to sell for, for some people that don't know about data structures and uh, these kind of things. So they would happily stay forever with the reference genomes, probably many of the biomedical groups. Uh, so I don't know, for them maybe selling this uh, extension to linear genomes is, should be easier. But I think in practice, uh, what matters is that which one solves better the problems they are working on. So we'll see. Well, you said that you were not prepared, but you gave lots of suggestions. Okay, so yeah. I, I can only wonder if you would uh, explain the future of No, that that was not business. Yeah, but I think there's room for many kind of directions. In research, you never know what will be the uh, final solution. So there's, there's a lot of development on all, all kinds of different approaches. Cyclic graphs, acyclic graphs, you know, set of reference genomes, and so forth. They will find their uh, audiences. And they will find the Yeah. More questions?